Welcome everybody to this week's VVBGA webinar on soil steaming and high tunnels featuring Becky Madden with UVM Extension and Andre Cantelmo of Heron Pond Farm should be joining us soon. This is Vern Grubinger, UVM Extension, um, reminding you to keep your microphones off until you want to speak and also feel free to enter questions or comments in the chat as Becky proceeds and then she will pause afterwards to address some of those and looking forward to a good discussion after she's done. Take it away, Becky. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm super excited that there are several farmers here who are steaming and have quite a bit more experience than I do. Um, I wanted to frame the conversation. Um, we're going to have Andre talking later. Um, a lot of you know he is an expert on soil steaming. Um, and I'm approaching this with two hats. One is as a farmer and one is as an extension researcher. So um, I'm going to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, kind of bouncing back and forth between the research and the hands-on experience. And really what I want to leave you all with is um, kind of some directions we want to head in and how we can collaborate as a group to improve our practices on steaming and share information. So. Um, so yeah, as Vern mentioned, if you can enter your questions in the chat or save them till the end, that would be great. And that way Andre can have a chance to share his knowledge. Um, so let me see if I can get my slides to go. So do you all know leafy greens have grown in economic importance in high tunnels, um, particularly like on my farm, we're on heavy clay soils. We really don't have an option for outdoor growing. So we're pushing hard on our high tunnels to go from tomatoes to greens back into tomatoes. You know, the numbers vary a lot for what the value is per square foot, but in, you know, for kind of selling wholesale in the organic market, three to $5 per square foot gross sales is a conservative estimate. I know the Arnold's have said they're up around $9 per square foot for some of their higher value greens and that's selling them retail but needless to say it's a pretty significant source of income on a farm and um, we put a lot of stock in just keeping our farm running through the winter with greens in the tunnels um and i remember many of you at the veg and berry growers meeting several years ago when krista from jericho settlers got up and i remember her talking about how she was trying to market chickweed as an edible weed and what a problem it was and i remember kind of being scratching my head and being like wow i really haven't seen this before in greens and then andre maybe a year or two later gave his talk on soil steaming and again i was like wow that's this is a big deal and sure enough um here i am several years later looking at tunnels that look like this and um the chickweed infestations are pretty hard to beat back. This is after several weedings. I've calculated that you know we're spending around a thousand bucks per tunnel and labor just trying to beat back the weeds enough to get a crop out of them. And it feels, you know, I feel kind of like it's a little bit like an aphid outbreak where you're like, I should have known better, but it just happens. It comes in and it feels like once it's there, it's hard to get away from it. And a lot of that has to do with biology of chickweed. It's a really challenging weed to control and it's a problem worldwide. It's a like highly adapted weed. It thrives in high nitrate and high potassium environments. So we are setting up the perfect scenario for it in a high tunnel, especially following tomatoes. Um, its seeds have three types of dormancy. So it's, you know, it's hard to kind of trick it into germinating and flushing it out, especially because during the summer it's, it's a winter annual weed. So we're not going to see much of it in the summer if we want to kind of give the greenhouse some time before greens and fallow it. We're really just not going to see a lot of chickweed come up. It's a super tricky weed. Um, and it's got these fibrous root systems, which makes mechanically cultivating it hard. For conventional growers, there's actually not a lot of herbicides that are labeled for vegetable production that would knock back chickweed. And its seed production is phenomenal. It's um, you know, the literature gives it anywhere from 2,500 to 25,000 seeds per plant. And what's especially tricky about it is that it's flowers, um, it's self pollinated, but it has those, I'm not going to say this right, but cleistigamous or cleistigamous flowers means they never actually open. So in the winter, they're not always actively flowering. You might not ever see a flower on it and it's setting seed in that little green capsule. So, um, all that's to say, it's a really, really hard um, weed to manage. The literature I've read also says you 
what you're seeing is about 6% of the viable seeds that are germinating. So when I'm looking at a tunnel like, like this, you know, 90 seeds haven't even popped yet. So it seems kind of fruitless. So, right, you just want to get rid of it. This is a couple of weeks ago. This is what our weed seed bank looked like after um, ripping out tomatoes in a very light tillage. And again, like with a lot of weeds, if you have landscape fabric down during the season, you're you're able to flush them out and manage them and then pop in the greens and weeds don't seem to be too much of an issue. But chickweed is the exception to that. It really takes advantage of the environment right after you pull up the landscape fabric. So, uh, you know, mechanical controls, again, it's really hard because of that fibrous root system. It tends to re-root really easily if you leave it on the soil afterwards. And um, it also kind of roots down off of the stems. So it forms kind of a horrible mat. Um, this is embarrassing, but this is our tunnel at the end of last spring, hand weeding it out and he's, he's shaking the seeds all over the surface, I'm sure. But um, this is again, after several weedings, we tried to establish our crop, got some harvests off of it and boom, there's the chickweed. So, and I know Andre is going to talk a little more about his experiments of solarizing. I haven't tried it, but it is an option. It, it you know, the, the limitations of it are our climate and the amount of time it takes to solarize. So it is possible. They have done it in Maine. You want to get your soil to about 50 degrees centigrade, which I think is about 100 in like 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's possible, but not really feasible, at least with, you know, on our farm, we have a pretty tight window of flipping into greens from tomatoes. So here we are. We finally jumped in to buying a soil steamer. Um, and you know just it's like for research purposes um i received a specialty crop block grant vernon and i received a specialty crop block grant through uvm extension to pay for my time addressing the research questions and the farm bought the steamer um so we're jumping into it and here's kind of the, the questions we wanted to address and i know a lot of the farmers on this call have also been asking these questions and doing some good on-farm research to figure these things out but really the million dollar question is always what's happening to the microbial populations you know the beneficial microbes that we work so hard as organic farmers to nurture when you blast steam into your soil and ultimately what i want to find out is what's the minimal temperature you can use to devastate the chickweed populations but still maintain a healthy microbial population and then in corollary to that does it really matter that much do the microbial populations rebound and also what's the impact on soil nutrients, especially nitrogen or nitrate. There, um, there's known to be a burst of um, ammonium after steaming, which can be toxic to plants. And some of the recommendations say to not plant immediately after steaming. So we're trying to take some soil samples to figure out what that nitrogen release is. And, um, and then just observationally, what's the longer term impact on, on diseases like in tomatoes, is the soil gonna be healthier um, so we're testing four different soil steaming temperatures and taking soil microbial samples up to a lab at uvm and also these um, soil samples every week after steaming and then we're going to do this for two years so tracking the changes over time and i'd love um you know farmers on this call if you guys want to be in touch with thoughts on the research that'd be great and um, this is all thanks to the Vermont um, Agency of Agriculture special, USDA specialty crop block grant. So these are the temperatures from some of the literature on um, what organisms can be killed at which temperatures. So the most of the steaming recommends 180 degrees Fahrenheit, but um, at 140 you can supposedly kill weed seeds. Up around 180 you're wiping pretty much everything out. Ideal setup for steaming, and I'm going to go pretty quickly because Andre will talk more about the um, the scenarios that he's tried out with steaming. But this is from a, a Japanese company. This website's pretty cool if you feel like checking them out, and they've been really responsive to emailed questions. Um, but essentially what you're doing is covering the soil with a impermeable sheet, like use greenhouse plastic or a a heavy piece of um, you know tarp or plastic, weighing it down tightly around the sides and then running a steam hose down the length. In this case, they're running it down the length of a bed. And what they're using is a steam delivery 
mechanism that distributes the steam evenly throughout the bed. Now, um, here's the rinky dink setup that we've developed on our farm. Um, so we have a, a steam hose coming off of the steamer to the bed, and then we throw down some used greenhouse plastic with weights around the edges. We have tried um, the the stuff they recommend is a Duras Grim tarp. We also bought that, and I'll explain why we've switched over to greenhouse plastic later. But I think they both work just fine. A lot of people are using used greenhouse plastic. <clears throat> we pre-inflate the tarp, so this is uh, the, <laughs> the top to a, a shop vac. But we've switched over to using a used inflator motor, just blowing some air in there ahead of time before the steam is delivered. The hose on the left there is the steam hose next to the shop vac, and then firing up the beast. So um, it's <laughs> the guy who delivered it said it was the largest teapot he had ever seen. And that's really all you're doing is just heating up water. Um, and it's a low pressure steamer. So it's coming out the out that black tube on the front. And then we're keeping an eye on the temperature at multiple spots around the bed, kind of to see how evenly we can get the steam and bearing those probes at two inches. These are some thermocouplers we borrowed. Um, Chris Callahan generously loaned us. Um, I did try using compost thermometers initially, and actually that's that picture on the right under the number, number six is the Duraskrim, and it was really hard to read the thermometer through the through the plastic, and you don't want to be lifting up the plastic to check the temperature. And then just um, uh, the joke in our house is it's like a two beer an hour job because you're kind of just like making sure nothing like goes wrong, keeping the water levels right, the pressure. I don't think it's something that's going to like blow up or anything, but um, we're just trying to keep the unit in working shape and we're still learning. We're very new to this. So you can get other jobs done while it's steaming. We've been running it for about an hour and a half, but um, you do want someone around keeping an eye on it. And at the bottom here, if you guys wanted to go back, the Sioux steamer has a pretty good, um, pretty good little video here on steaming basics. So again, here's our um, here's our setup with the used steamer we bought. Um, I probably I th think it looks just like the one that Pete Johnson was selling. Um, it's it's from Ontario. It was used on tobacco farms originally, um, and then the used greenhouse plastic. And then our um, this will make all of your time worth it. Hopefully, it's using this dental sterilization tubing. It's uh, really cheap and it helps weigh down the edges. And if you are looking for a way to, to deliver the steam down the bed, that's um, an $8 replacement for something that the Japanese company was selling for 200 bucks. And it's the same thing. And then um, I just wanted to show what we've spent on the on the unit. Um, again, this is a used steamer. I think uh, Andre will tell you better than I can. New ones are, I think, around 20 to 30 grand, but it could be wrong. I'm guessing it, hope, hoping it'll last us 10 years and we can use it on five tunnels a year, which puts it at about 127 bucks per tunnel. I might be optimistic. <laughs> we have really hard water, so we're like, oh no. Um, and then fuel, we're paying two bucks a gallon right now. We're using um, about three gallons an hour. So um, crunching down the numbers on the time we're standing around pulling other weeds or <laughs> drinking a beer, whatever, is 144 bucks per tunnel. So it is taking a lot of time. I think we're getting a little more efficient, but it, it does feel like a lot of fussing and moving things around in time. Um, so this is rough, but somewhere around 340 bucks per tunnel. I would love other people's thoughts on what they're spending. So this is what we're trying to get down to is improving our system. Um, we decided to go with these blocks of 16 by 16 feet, like 16 by 16 feet blocks. Um, we tried to do the longer beds, but it, it just felt like we weren't getting the steam down all the way through. Hopefully we can work our way to that. Again, we're still learning. Getting accurate temperatures, really laying out the tunnel ahead of time. Um, I'm worried about moving things around and moving weed seeds from the unsteamed areas onto the steamed areas and just walking on the beds. Um, Moistening the soil ahead of time really improves the conductivity of the heat. And um, it's it also like kind of imbibes the seeds ahead of time. So the mortality of the seeds is really improved by that. And again, the um, 
it seems like the steaming really affects the texture and tilth of the soil. So any walking we've done even near the steam bed seems to cause incredible compaction. So again, being very thoughtful about our layout ahead of time seems to be a good um, structure for us to follow. Chris Callahan built this really cool calculator that has helped us um, put some math to what we've been figuring out on our own. So there's a link here, it's a Google Sheet. Um, and he's, I know he's on the call, he can talk a little bit more, but um, this really helps refine the system and, and figure out, you know, if you've got, you know, certain size boiler, burner, um, et cetera. So well, thank you, Chris, you're the best. And just quick facts we've seen from this, um, and again, a lot of you have more experience on this than I do so far, but I, I was pretty impressed. This is one of the lowest temperatures. This is one of our first steams. I think it only got to like 120 degrees maybe, and still you can see the difference in the chickweed. So I'm super optimistic that we might be able to find a system that's a lower temperature uh, steam, which will be qu quicker, cheaper, and probably healthier for the microbes. Um, And I've also noticed a big difference in the low temperature area. I tweezered out 341 chickweed seedlings after the first week on one square foot and found the damping off was really bad in that block compared to that's the same seeding. So optimistic. Andre did mention damping off and pythium moves in actually quite a bit after steaming in a couple of weeks. So we might see a uptick in things and, you know, then the next question is, do you want to inoculate with something beneficial or not sure? So this is where we're headed and where we'd love collaboration from other farmers and extension people, but trying to really define these best practices, documenting the costs and the yields, really understanding this impact on soil microbes, at least being able to give a definitive answer like, yes, it wipes them out and they'll come back or no, there doesn't seem to be an, a significant impact or here's the strategy. It does negatively impact them and you want to add x y and z you know compost and root shield or actinovate whatever and um you know maybe there's additional research here this is a pretty short and um not a not a robustly funded project so um maybe there's a bigger deeper dive someone wants to take here and finally i love the idea of a um a steamer sharing system that andre has helped set up in southern new hampshire um for it seems like a good piece of equipment for farmers to share so you can trailer them around so i was just curious if that's something we want to think about i know Vern just asked about the um, microbial plates we're using um so i'm working with a lab up at uvm they've been super helpful deb Nair and her lab she does a lot of work on soil microbiology and it's interesting because comparing this she's done a lot of anaerobic soil sterilization and um, research on tarping so how this kind of compares to that is one of my big questions. She recommended using these things called ecoplates, which give a broader understanding of the impact on soil microbe communities. My understanding is if you wanted to look at like sulfur or nitrogen or any individual um, microbially released nutrient, you can find the enzyme that specifically targets that microbe. Um, I'm not explaining this super well, but she recommended these eco plates because they give a broader stroke on these communities. And um, I actually haven't gotten any results back yet, but we should just get populations of kind of categorized by type of microbe. And I'm happy to share those results as we're getting them. So, um, and they're kind of a layperson's tool. So I think it's a I, part of the reason I chose it is something I think we can all use on our own. I just bought them and they have a reader up at the lab. So um you have a question about the distribution of steam under the tarps there as well so we chat. tried using a distribution hose um we tried I, I showed a picture of that dental sterilization tubing the guys in japan use the same exact thing it's a polyethylene tube that's perforated that goes down the length of the bed i also found somebody in denver who makes a canvas steam distribution hose that was super expensive um so we bought this dental stuff and hole punched it and rolled it out and ran the steam through it. And we just felt like we weren't getting, there wasn't enough pressure from the steamer to distribute it evenly. Cause you're trying to like 
kind of blow it out those little holes. I'd love to use it because I think it would be a more precise system, but um, we went back to just blowing the steam under these square tarps. Oh, so Curtis said he's using the, the canvas one from Sue. So yeah, people are using the the sleeve hoses. I would love to, uh, you know, maybe we should go back to trying it. Um, we've gotten better burner efficiency thanks to some of Chris's help on our steamer. We changed the burner, we changed the output. So maybe we should try it again. Um, are there any other questions? Jennifer says she's using a nylon hydraulic sleeve hose. Is that that's different than what you just showed, right? I think so. Um, you know, one thing, I don't know if I was being paranoid, but I also was worried about something that was gonna like put um, any polymers or anything like off gassy plasticky stuff into the soil. Um, so that was part of my reason too for choosing the, I, I would have loved the canvas actually. I thought that was a really great option but the dental sterilization tubing too, I thought would be a little like less yucky, but maybe I'm just being excessively worried about those sorts of things. Well, thanks, Becky, really um, great info. It's a small enough group. I think you could unmute and ask a question or feel free to continue typing in the text. I know Curtis is here. He's he's um, doing a SARE grant on some of this, um, and he's been really helpful to me with this project. And um, anyone else who wants to, Curtis, do you want to chime in and describe your project? Sure. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not much different than what Becky's doing. She's doing a lot more uh, quantitative study. We, um, we've been at it now for a little over a year. We bought our steamer from Pete up in Vermont. Uh, it's, it looks identical to the one that Becky has. I um, imagine the same manufacturer, if not all the same pieces and parts. I'm really interested in hearing uh, a little more about that more efficient burner, because I think that's a big, um, a, a big space for improvement there. Uh, but after about a year, you know, our, our results are, yeah, astonishing in terms of weed control. Uh, we do go for a pretty high temperature. We would all, that one of the things I'm really excited to see come out of this study is best practice there because we are aiming for 170 to 180 because, as, as Becky said, that's kind of what the literature indicates. But then again, um, that's not necessarily what my experience has indicated either. I know there have been times when we haven't hit that temperature and we still seem to get very good weed control. Uh, another thing I'll point out is that the weed control to us was actually a secondary um, consideration we originally thought that we were after well we originally bought the steamer because we were trying to get rid of sclerotinia which is lettuce drop and I, I don't know if that's a big issue for you guys in the northeast but for us in the midwest it's kind of a nightmare scenario where in the in the typical high tunnel conditions of the winter and early spring we're sometimes losing as much as 50 percent of our head lettuce to this uh, fungus and so that has been really effective um, it, we've had pretty much zero uh, lettuce drop or sclerotinia in beds that we've steamed, as long as we don't get too deep into the soil. So as long as we don't uh, you know, disturb things too much in transplanting or seeding. Um, and then that too deep seems to be about anything deeper than about two and a half inches and we start to bring up other stuff, including some weed seeds as well. Uh, and that seems to be about how deep our temperature gets uh, with the system we're using, which I'm interested in hearing I know Andre has, has had some experience with trying to get the steam to go deeper. Um, anything other thing that I have uh, uh, unique to say, I guess is, and maybe not unique, but it is, we also seem to see an increase in damp off and botrytis. Um, botrytis is kind of a new problem for us in the tunnels as of last year. And well, uh, okay, I should clarify. We think it's a new problem. It does look a lot like uh, uh, lettuce drop or sclerotinia if you are used to seeing a lot of sclerotinia. So it's possible that we are just more tuned in now and so we're noticing that it's not sclerotinia, uh, that we are getting some botrytis. Still dramatically less. I mean, we're probably seeing like a, you know, a 2% loss rate to this botrytis. Um, 
but we do wonder if it is partly a result of, of sort of sterilizing the soil and now the opportunists like uh, Botrytis that are kind of uh, ever present move in easily and, and take over. So, but otherwise, yeah, I, I concur with what Becky has said, which is the weed control is amazing. Uh, it's a huge time suck. Uh, but then again, I would rather be spending my time watching a steamer cook soil than uh, working my way down a, you know, a spinach bed weeding out chickweed that I know is going to come back in two or three weeks. So uh, that's the takeaway from us. Great. That's thanks. Awesome. thanks. Super informative and um, remind people they'll be able to find your reports on the SARE project database once you're done with your project. Uh, Skip, you have been steaming for a long time. Do you have anything to add to this conversation? Yeah, uh, am I coming through? Yes, you Can are. You hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I got one of Pete's uh, machines like we're seeing there. Um, what are some of our takeaways doing it for the last three years? Um, well, one of the things I heard that Paul Arnold had talked to the Sioux people and there's some type of technology that they have. It's like a, I think it's a four by eight. Uh, it's like a solid thing that has three inch uh, emitters and it's like a plate. And he said, you can steam stuff like very like 15 minutes over this plate and it's gone down three or four inches and it steams down deeper and more accurately. If the problem is moving this <laughs> four by eight hot plate around, it's a little unyieldy. I don't know if Paul actually went up and bought one, but he was threatening to because he was getting fed up, you know, trying to deal with getting even pressure across his, uh, his uh, he uses the Sioux uh, woven uh, black uh, uh, tarp tube that we have as well. And we like that. Uh, what we ended up doing, we thought the blower was actually cooling it down too much. So we ended up taking old types of uh, hooping material and just put tiny hoops across uh, the area to try to get some loft to the, uh, the uh, steaming tarp. We bought the tarp from uh, the Sioux people. It's kind of a plasticky, very tough tarp. Um, the tarp was too wide. I think we ended up cutting it down. We're working with a tarp that's about, uh, I think about 14 feet wide now. And we go down about um, 65 feet. And then we took a piece of uh, the PVC uh, uh, electrical conduit and we made kind of a U-turn, a gentle U-turn using 45 degree angles so that the tube the steam could go down the tube and then come back down the other side of this 14 foot area. So we have, and that, that actually worked pretty good. We were not, before we were just we were hoping the tube would push it and come back and it just wasn't enough pressure. So uh, that's one of the things we've been kind of playing with is trying to figure out a way. The first year, two years we used it, we only got the pressure up to about five PSI. And then Andre gave me some courage to, <laughs> to let the water level and the, and the uh, steamer go down to about a third off the bottom of the, of the uh, glass indicator. And once we got the water stabilized at that level, our pressure coming out of the steamer into the, got up to around eight and a half, nine PSI, and we were getting more thorough movement of the steam through the first initial sock and then back down the other side. Um, it's taking us about, two hours plus to um, get to the 140 degrees that we're shooting for. Um, and uh, we have an ancient uh, burner on ours. I think this thing was made in the 60s. So I'm all ears about new and more efficient uh, burners that we could be using. But yeah, we're using at least five gallons an hour or more. Yeah, the thing really gobbles up the oil. Um, Let's see, what else are we doing? Well, we're, we're, we're worried about the microbes uh, being damaged. And so we just started using some uh, tenovate and some double nickel, some other things. I don't, I've never done a very scientific approach to seeing if we're helping anything, but it's kind of the, one of the things we water in. Uh, we're using a combination of, we have a Jang Cedar, one of the five units 
and we push the units together about three inches apart and we go up and down each bed when we're doing direct seating and then we also use uh, which has been great from the rainflow people andre had them design a uh, a dibbler it's a uh, about 24 inches wide it's got four dibbles across it it's one solid piece which we use for our onions but this is how we're putting in a lot of the seated and plug units that we're putting in so we're putting in um, a lot of dragoon and a lot of uh, the miniature romaines and then of course the salanoa and that dibbler is working great to just up and down the rows to uh make that work um, what else am i got to say uh, our steamer <laughs> I'm encouraging everybody that has one of these to check your pressure uh, relief valve, and probably replace it every two or three years. We've got hard water and the thing kind of got jammed once and somebody forgot to open up one valve and the thing nearly blew its stack. So I'm <laughs> a firm believer in making sure that pressure regulator is probably replaced every three years. It costs all of maybe $6, but we have heavy, a uh, lot of uh, calcium in our water. So it, it plugs up things like that. Um, I think that's about all I have to say about it. We're just learning as we're going, and it's—I haven't had the dampening off, but we're doing so many houses. By the time it is, a, probably about ten days before I start seeding spinach and stuff into it. So maybe uh, if I did it right away, I would have more problems with the dampening off. It was interesting to hear Becky talk about that as a problem. Um, we haven't seen it yet, but we're using a combination of direct seeding, things like Yokatana and other things into that soil, and then a combination of just plug production. Um, yeah, chickweed is a non-event for us. We can grow a dragoon that we're putting in as a three-week-old uh, plug getting that out in January, we just slightly scratch it with a rake and put in another set of Dragoon and get another crop coming out in March and the chickweed has just not been happening. So uh, it's been a great ultimate. It's, I think it's very cost effective for it. We have about 14 greenhouses where we're moving it through as best we can. Um, biggest thing, it's the timing. I mean, we're taking tomatoes out of these houses and mid-September it's like it's a it's a it's a it's very difficult to find the time to do all 14 houses sometimes we just put the plug production in houses we don't have time to steam and then just do the time we have to steam what we can so it is a time eater and it's usually mostly affected by taking a tomato crop or something else out in a timely fashion uh, before you get time to steam Great. Uh, That's some good info, Skip. And Becky's taking notes. One of the goals of this grant is to put together a manual of best practices and um, getting some good guidance here today. Jennifer, did you want to add anything about your steaming system while we have you on the call? It's actually David, Jennifer's husband. How are you guys? Good. Good to hear you. Can you hear me okay, Vern? Yes. Go ahead. Um, well, the first caveat is we're down in Maryland. We're, you know, we're interlopers, but we bought, so our situation is similar, but we had different goals. Um, we have the same steamers, everybody else in the photographs. We got it out of Canada. It had been refurbished. Someone asked a question about the burner. I went through the whole thing. I don't know how to make it more efficient. The numbers sound pretty reasonable to me, about three gallons per minute or per hour. It, it's got a big nozzle. It's a four and a half. 4.5 burner, um, which is I, I'm told is 4.5 gallons per hour. I got it at the you know the HVAC supply place, so that's consistent with what we're seeing. It is a, it is a time suck. We we had hopes of trying to do a whole bed, 95 foot tunnels. We didn't get that. We used plastic greenhouse mulch. We're on 48 inch bed tops, and we quickly discovered we could only do about half of it. So we're sort of seeing about 200 square feet at a pop that gets us up to what what their literature says is the ideal temperature about 180 and we're seeing that temperature at 
um, easily at two inches on our sandy loam soils. Um, let's see, uh, we, we were interested in chickweed, certainly in Scortinia for the winter productions of the greens, but also down where we are in Maryland, we've got problems with root knot nematode in our tomato tunnels and things like Southern blight, big, big problems with that. So we were chasing those things almost as much as we were the winter um, annual problem. Um, we did it. One, we didn't know this for one year. It, it seems like it's working pretty well. When we pulled the one house of tomatoes out, the oldest one we had, we I looked carefully at the tomatoes that were coming out, and I only saw a handful of the hundreds and hundreds that were in there that showed any signs of root knot nematode. That soil had previously been tested the year earlier prior to steaming, and definitely were showing problems with that. There were certain crops we couldn't even grow anymore, like baby carrots. So it seemed, it's maybe anecdotal, it wasn't certainly tested rigorously, but that seemed to work out pretty well for us. On the leafy greens, um, someone mentioned about dampen off. It, what I've sort of seen is that, yeah, the, the thing puts a lot of moisture in the soil and it, it takes a while for it to kind of kind of dry out. And it, obviously that depends on the time of year. So we, we sort of try to, we had a little bit of that when you just put the plugs in, if you're doing Salanova or something, it seems like that you might want to give it a, a day or two or maybe even longer before you go right back in, at least with the plugs. Direct seeding, it seemed less of a problem with things like arugula. Um, I, I did have sort of an observation, again, it's just anecdotal, you know, about the microbes. And my observation has been that it, it seems like things kind of grow pretty vigorously as, as soon as you go back into that steam soil. And whether that's, we're, we're steaming like most people, I don't wanna do it in July, it's hot enough down here. So we're doing that in early spring, typically late fall if we have the window. And it seems as though um, things are just getting a jump really quick. And I don't know if that's a function of a bit more available nitrogen um, in plant form, or if it's a function of just increased soil temperatures. I'd be curious if everybody else has seen something like that, because it seems like things just really kind of take, take off pretty quickly as soon as you put them in that steamed bed. That's kind of what my, that's my observation right now. Excellent, really helpful, thanks. You're welcome. Um, before we get on to answering your question, I'll just ask Chris, if you're on the call, can you speak to this whole um, burner efficiency and your recommendations or observations so far, folks? Sorry, Vern, about the burner specifically? Yeah, people or? are talking about trying to make it more efficient and replacing, and you did something with Becky. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, the motivation for that spreadsheet, I mean, I, I don't need much of an excuse to build a spreadsheet, but um, the motivation was, you know, Becky and um, Scott were sort of w wondering why, why a bed of a certain size was taking a certain amount of time to to get the temperature <clears throat> and you know it really comes down to how much how much heat how much energy you're putting into the boiler to make steam and how much steam you're getting into that into that um into the uh, steaming tarp and so you know at the end of the day it really comes down to the gallons per hour that you're burning um into that into the boiler um and so the the mo one of the most common burners that you will find if you go to a plumbing and um, heating supply store is a, a Beckett AFG. Uh, they're they're used in many many oil boilers and furnaces, and one of the reasons is they're highly adjustable. Um, so you can I, I forget the exact range, but I think you can you can put you know you swap in a different nozzle on that burner to adjust the gallons per hour that you're burning, which adjusts the basically the 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 amount of steam that you make. And so with Scott and Becky, I think they were able to eventually swap in a three gallon per hour nozzle um, and increase the, the energy input into the boiler, which gave them more steam, which let them steam the same size bed more quickly. Um, so it's, you know, there, there's nuance to it, there's details, but um, it's covered, well covered in there um, in Beckett manual. And um, if you are struggling and scratching your head about how long something's taking, for a bed, um, you know that calculator can help you figure out if you're if you're in the realm of possibility um, for for what you have for a, a burner. Is that what you were getting at? Yeah, great. 
open it up if there's any questions for Chris and uh, any response to Dave's question about seeing more vigorous growth after steaming. Uh, this is Curtis Millsap again. I just will second that that response seems to be consistent for us too. We seem to have a big growth response. And I think what that, you know, what makes sense to me is that we're killing off a whole bunch of biology and that's freeing up those nutrients. You know, what, what would be interesting to know is how much that affects the next crop. And I guess that's kind of what I'm hoping Becky's research is going to show us is how quickly is that biology recovering? But I mean, pretty consistent that if you kill a whole bunch of you know, tillage is essentially doing the same thing. You knock out a whole bunch of soil biology, all those decomposing uh, microbes give us a huge kick in fertility that, you know, initially makes a real positive change for growth. Wouldn't temperature also do that, Vern? Yeah, the soil temperature, um, the question is how long does that endure? I mean, you would think that um, it would sort of come back down to normal ambient, but this is something only only with monitoring will we will we be able to know. How many monitors have you have you got in? Becky, maybe you want to say just how many plots you have and some of the treatments. Yeah. Right temperature. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting question, and and I mean coupling the release of nitrates, like I agree with Curtis that that what's happening is that you know, immediate smackdown of the biology releases nitrates, but also the, the flip side of that is, you know, how much ammonium and is there any times like a negative impact on that? Um, doesn't seem like anybody's seeing that. So that's good. Um, we've been, I, I put in some um, data loggers in the soil for, and left them in for like a whole day after steaming um, for the second tunnel we did basically spent the first tunnel fussing with it and trying to figure things out. Second tunnel is more uh, kind of data collection, hopefully. Um, we were pulling out the steam tube after 15 minutes, but leaving the tarp on for, you know, until we needed to move it again. Some of the stuff I've read says to do like a cool down process. And I'm wondering what the reasoning for that is. Um, if it's just like in a more industrial system, people are trying to plant right away or if there's some reason biologically or you know pathogenically or whatever that you'd want to cool it down quickly. I'm not sure about that. I've been digging around trying to figure that out. But um, yeah, I'd be happy to share the data loggers. I mean, it stayed warm for almost 24 hours in one of the beds down at two inches. I think it was like, I want to say it was 100, 100 or 90 degrees 24 hours after steaming at two inches. So it's staying warm and that would also enhance the nitrate release in the soil and i'm curious to see what that drop off is you know if this is gonna you know eat up a lot of the nitrate but it, you know in a high tunnel scenario that's kind of great to be using up whatever nitrate we can and then you can always add more there's no uh, leaching anyway so um i don't know we'll see is that answering that question yeah and just thought give people a little background. You know, you've got the control, obviously, of unsteamed, and then you've got several yeah. several different temperatures, right? Yeah, and initially, I mean, when Vern and I were coming up with this idea, we were more like thinking, oh, we'll look at the amount of time it takes. But really, you know, in my conversations with people ahead of time, it's you can't with this kind of old steamer it's hard to really get precise so we are doing 120 degrees 140 degrees 160 degrees and 180 degrees and then an unsteamed control um and then we're going to kind of keep track of our time spent weeding the unsteamed control and trying to keep it <laughs> away from everything else but those are the four temperatures we are working with so we'll see and looking at the microbial activity before, obviously, and then um, after, and then six months after again, correct? Yeah, what I decided to do um, actually more recently was I took I took samples before and then immediately after, and then at planting time, because Deb said it's like a huge difference the minute you introduce 
a plant, the microbial communities change a lot. So as we're planting, I'm taking another sample and then doing two or three weeks subsequently to really track the immediate effect on microbial communities and then waiting and doing a month and then six months and then a year. So we're kind of seeing the longer term impacts, but she really pushed me to do a little more on the immediate side of things to just see how things are shifting quickly. Great. Um, I did Burn, text... one of the things. Go ahead. One thing I wanted to comment on is that all the houses we have the best success with in winter growing, uh, even before steaming or anything else, is our east-west oriented houses. The sun comes in and heats up the soil, and I think it activates the uh, you know the microbes and everything functioning a lot better in these east-west houses versus the older north-south oriented houses and uh, and then also just how old the house is how many years of active compost uh, you've put in there is i think been uh, helping us out in our certainly our houses that are seven or eight years old they've got a certain level of organic matter that is you know part of the engine driving the system Yeah, and I wonder how that relates to the temperature and, um, you know, maybe biophysical release of nitrate, not just microbial, just by heating up all that um, organic matter. I was... Um, go ahead. I, I wanted to ask, too, I know Curtis put this in the chat, but um, if people are thinking they want to steam every year or should steam every year, I. I had been under the impression that it's like a once every three year thing for our needs in the Northeast, but um, maybe I'm misled in that. So I, I don't know, what are folks seeing out there? We took a year off on one house and I'm kind of, after having done it for three years in a row, so I will have a report <laughs> for you probably by late December, uh, to see just how, and we're only rototilling we're doing in that house is with one of the uh, not the old-fashioned rototiller, but the uh, the one that's made by VCS, kind of called power vader. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really churn the soil like a regular rotovator, so that's the only soil mixing machines we use now. So uh, we're not rototilling down for three or four inches. We're just scratching the surface with all the time. So this one house that that's all we've done through tomatoes and other things. So I'll be curious to see what happens, to see what, what the checkweed report is gonna be in that house. Hmm. Great, thanks. Yeah, and our experience, this is Curtis again, has been that um, even in just this one year cycle, we're definitely seeing a return of, of weeds in some beds. It does seem to be very connected to uh, how we've handled the soil. So obviously if we're digging deep to transplant, like you know, big tomato plugs, those kinds of things, then we're definitely causing ourselves problems later uh, in terms of weed control. Whereas the beds that, that we are doing really uh, pretty strict shallow cultivation uh, or even just topping up with compost and things like that, we seem to have a lot less weed pressure. Yeah, I guess that's one of the things I've been thinking a lot about too is um, what the kind of management is after steaming if we're really have to focus on not um, disturbing the soil too much. Like we had just bought one of those zippers for transplanting that I really like, but I'm not sure we should use that where we steamed. And then also um, I'm wondering if we should not use our landscape fabric again from the tomatoes um, if, if you guys are just using all sterile materials after steaming. If that's a concern. Yeah, I definitely feel like we bring seeds in on used row cover and on, on used ground cover. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but I keep thinking that what I should do there is kind of stack those things up and steam them before reusing them. Uh, but I, again, that's you know one more thing to do. Becky mentioned that steamer sharing program just got funded in 
Southwest New Hampshire with a SARE partnership grant. Does Tasha, you're in New Hampshire, have you heard any more details about that? Or Becky, did you hear from Andre? Anything else about how it works? I have not heard anything. Yeah, I don't know uh, anything more than that they bought a nice, a really top-notch steamer from Sue and they got it on a um, a good trailer so they can just trailer the thing around on the road without having to load and unload it, which seems like a key factor in easy sharing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a Cheshire County Conservation District, which has a lot of other equipment for sharing. So I assume it's gonna, you know, they have a pretty slick system for reserving and, and moving equipment. I don't know exactly what the what the setup is, but I haven't seen it listed on their website yet. I think it's still in the works. Any final questions or comments in the few minutes we have left? Yeah, I did price one out um, this fall for a brand new one from Sue, and uh, yeah, it was going to be something like twenty-five grand, I think. So that is something that would have to be a shared project for sure. <laughs> That's a good way to use those kind of grants. Does anybody have a sense of the lifespan of these um, units? How old is yours, Becky? You got it? Do you have any idea? I think it's from the. 50s or 60s and the guy I, I i think it's the same dude who's doing all these and selling them through pete um he retubes them so he buys them from they're sitting on the side of the roads at these old tobacco farms and he said the tubes are the things that go on them everything else i think is relatively replaceable on it and the tubes are the things that are hard and expensive to to replace so i think ours will last i mean we have the same problem as skip with hard water we're concerned that we're going to like clog everything with our um our our water just builds up um sediment really really quickly but i think that's manageable and i think every other part on I mean, it showed up with like three things broken on it and i cried and luckily my husband is pretty handy and fixed a bunch of things but um i think they're relatively simple machines and relatively crude so as long as the tubes are in good shape i think they'll last a long time does make me wonder about some kind of water filtration if you're trying to for treatment for the hard water if that's a concern yeah i was I, we, we were just having that conversation the other day i was trying to figure out if we want to soften it ahead of time or what you know what's going to happen the other thing I, i'm sure all you guys know this but we had a lot of warnings about freezing it you really have to drain and open the valves <laughs> when it's you know the frosts that'd be a problem yeah, and the whole the whole uh, hard water thing, we haven't explored this yet, but I know that in industrial systems, it's really common to descale these things. So there's got to be that technology out there and that knowledge base. We just have to kind of latch onto that and figure out how it's done. But but they are, you know, in they're using a lot of industrial process, and in most of those cases, they're going to use some sort of descaling system, and they're going to do that on a regular maintenance basis, you know, per hours of operation or something. That's not what we're going to do this year. Ours, when you empty the very bottom of it, the very bottom drain holes, which are a good two inch wide, all sorts of flakes have been coming out of this thing for years. And I think uh, we've concluded we have to put a descaler in there. I'm a little bit worried sometimes if you descale something, you kind of open up things that were sealed. <laughs> so um, yeah, but I think it's I think it's something we're going to have to do. We're going to have one problem short term or long term, but I think the scaling is something I wished uh, we had started right from the get go. I think to Dave's point, uh, you know, blowing it down on a regular basis so that the scale doesn't build up. Um, you know, if you think about it, you are evaporating water constantly. And so trace minerals are going to get left behind. So with most steam boilers, <clears throat> the preventive maintenance schedule that blows the boiler down helps helps clear out the bottom on a more regular basis. So in addition to yeah. typically treating the, the inlet water to feed. I'll add one other note. We got ours probably from the same guy, the same dude as you called him. Um, and it was retubed, which is, seems to be the wear point. The other thing though we noticed is that when we first got it, it's got a float valve in there that connects to electrical sw switches for the float level and it shuts the burner off. 
it wasn't working correctly. I opened up that thing and it was full of scale, a rust scale. So it's a recommendation if you get one, you haven't done it, open up that, that big black valve assembly on the side. It's about a series of eight or nine bolts. And it looks, it comes right apart. It looks like a toilet bowl, the old kind with like the brass bulb in there. That thing was full of corrosion, just chunks of rust. The thing where I've been sitting, you know, in a barn somewhere for 20 years. Once we got that all cleaned up, then the mechanism worked a lot more efficiently and it was less of a concern of safety as well. Is there any way you could get a photograph of that to uh, Becky so she can add that as a photograph to put with this talk? Because I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds like it's something I should be paying attention to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. What's yeah. your address, Becky? I'll do it right, I'll, right I'll now. I'll put it in the chat. Um, I, somebody okay. else warned me about that too. Thanks for bringing that up, David. Um, yeah, it's, it's a simple fix. I didn't even use, I just used the same gasket. You'll see it, you go, oh, okay, I got it. Yeah, that's a simple, easy do. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah so we're just about uh, out of time, but one thing I'm thinking about is how to keep this group well connected. I know there've been a lot of informal networks, but should we start up a soil steaming in tunnels listserv or something like that? Or maybe one already exists that I'm not aware of? I was going to suggest the same thing, Vern. I mean, we, we, we've we done that with the AZS rinse conveyors too. sort of started a users group that gets together occasionally and shares all the things you'd normally have in a user's manual. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I know Paul Arnold would love to have probably been aware of this talk today. So there's about three or four other people I can think of that would definitely be into it. I'd be I'd be happy to organize something. Um, I have been in touch with Paul. He was actually super helpful getting this going too. Um, so yeah, I can I think I'll have everybody's addresses after this talk. And if you want to keep sharing information, that would be super. Okay, we can look into setting up a list on the UVM site or something like that. Um, Chris, did you see that question from Steve asking about um, the? Okay, great see that all right everybody well we've hit the one o'clock mark so thank you for a great presentation becky excellent discussion the slides and a recording of this will be posted on the webinar website which i keep putting out on the listserv and uh, spread the word for folks to go visit those things and to join us on future webinars have a great afternoon thanks everyone thank you Vern. thank you